I'm going to present a program that we implement currently in Athens, Greece, uh, targeting people who inject drugs. The, problem, uh, the program is called Aristotle HIV HIV. These are my disclosures. So to give you some background information, uh, in Athens, uh, using capture recapture methodology, we estimate that there are approximately 9,000 high-risk drug users. Of those, 2,500 report injection in the last 30 days. This is a population with a very high burden of HIV and HIV infection. Uh, Athens was one of the first cities experiencing an HIV outbreak in the previous years, along with Romania. Then, of course, there were more outbreaks occurring in, in Glasgow, in Ireland, in Luxembourg, in Indiana. So, uh, in the previous years, we had 10 to 20 HIV cases reported per year. And in 2011, we escalated to 320 cases. This resulted in a prevalence of 16.5% in this population. But apart from HIV infection, we used to have high prevalence of HIV infection for many years. So we estimate that the prevalence of hepatitis C among uh, people who inject drugs entering opioid substitution treatment programs is 85%. And it, there is also indication of uh, increased transmission uh, for example, uh, if, we, if you see the numbers of the prevalence among new injectors, people who have started injecting in the previous two years, this has increased from 45% in 2009 to 72% in 2012, uh, which shows that as soon as people start injecting, 70% of, of them uh, become infected in the first two years of their injection career. Concerning harm reduction coverage in, in Athens, the truth is that, that before the outbreak, the coverage was very low. Uh, thanks to this outbreak, there was increased uh, number of people who enter opioid substitution treatment programs, but still, at the time that we are talking now, uh, people have to wait for at least six months to enter these um, uh, OST programs. There is a waiting list. Also, needle and syringe programs were increased. Before the outbreak, we provided very few syringes per person per year. Uh, this increased to more than 200 syringes, but still now we, had a, we have a decline. I think there is a kind of compl complacency in these measures. On the other hand, there is access to DAAs. Uh, actually, uh, there was a national treatment registry set up, and uh, clinicians have to uh, enter some information about the patient, including also some test results. And through that treatment registry, they ask for approval to receive DAAs. Uh, in July 2007, only people with co-infection, HIV, HIV co-infection, or uh, fibrosis states F2 and above were eligible for treatment. But in September, very recently, all restrictions were removed. So everyone can get treatment. However, a small proportion of people who inject drugs uh, actually access treatment with DAAs. So the idea was to set up a program in order to increase diagnosis and treatment for hepatitis C infection, but also for HIV, based on the, given the fact that we had this outbreak a few years ago among people who inject drugs in Athens. So the target population is 3,000 uh, injecting drug users, people who report injecting drug use in the past 12 months, and they are adult, adults. And the design of this prog uh, program was based on an earlier program that was implemented during the HIV outbreak. That program was called Aristotle, and it was very effective in reaching very rapidly a large number of uh, drug users and test them for HIV and link them to care. And actually, it was included among the programs showing good practice um, uh, to HIV in, by WHO Europe. So the idea of this program is to, it's, it's a sick test treat intervention. So there is a sick part where we identify uh, as many drug users as possible. We test them for hepatitis C and HIV. Uh, we also provide uh, evaluation of their fibrosis and there is also an interview with a questionnaire. And then there is a link and treat component where we link people with HIV and HIV in, uh, infection uh, with the help of a peer navigator. So reaching this target population is the most, one of the challenging parts because drug users are a hard to reach population and within this population there are some subgroups that are even more hard to reach. Uh, if for example a drug user is an immigrant without uh, legal documents then it's not very easy to convince them um, to reach a, a service. 
Uh, also, there was a need to implement this quite rapidly and to achieve high coverage of the population. And of course, ideally, we would like to have a, a sample of uh, participants in our program and to have a representative uh, estimates of the population characteristics. <coughs> So, in order to reach the population, we used respondent-driven sampling, which is this chain referral method where you start with an initial number of recruits. These are drug users who are uh, friendly to the program, that they have large in injection networks, so they are invited to participate. And then we give them three coupons and we ask them to recruit people from their injection network. And then people who the recruits, they come to the study site and then they are provided coupons and they provide and they recruit other people and in this way we have this change of uh, recruits over time. And at the end, the good thing with RDS is that at the end the sample is independent of the initial seed selected. And the other thing is that there is uh, appropriate methodology to uh, obtain estimates that are more or less estimates uh, of the population. Uh, RDS is based on incentives. We have used monetary incentives to, uh, and we give money to people who participated and who also recruited other people. And at some point, we also introduced a, an incentive uh, to enhance linkage to care, to, to have their first visit with the clinicians. And the study site is, uh, was purposely, uh, purposely uh, selected to be in the center of Athens, in uh, a square in the center of Athens where you wouldn't have a coffee, but it's a place that drug users tend to hang out. So this is the process. People uh, arrive at the study site because they are invited by their peers. And after obtaining uh, informed consent, we proceed with blood sample collection. We perform also fiber scan. Uh, and there is an interview with a, a standard questionnaire. Then bloods, uh, bloods are um, uh, transported to a lab every day. At the end of this process, people uh, get a uh, monetary incentive for their participation and three coupons to recruit other people. They are asked to return a few days later to collect their test results, but they also collect their secondary incentives. This is the, the incentives for recruiting other people, so they have a second reason to return to the study site. And then people who are uh, infected with HIV and HIV, they are linked to infectious diseases uh, units, whereas people who have chronic hepatitis infection without HIV, for those cases, clinicians, we have set up a network of clinicians, they visit the study site, they review the information that we have for the patient, they enter this information in the National Treatment Registry to requ request approval, and when this approval is granted, then we have an appointment, the peer navigator accompanies the patient to that first um, appointment with a clinician in the, in the hospital. So we need to take some steps to improve linkage to care. First of all, in order to obtain approval for DAAs, uh, some data concerning the patient have to be recorded to this national treatment registry. One uh, of these data is uh, their social security number and also the results of some tests such as genotype and fiber scan. And these uh, tests are not performed in Greece without cost. The, the, the people, patients have to pay for them. And drug users, of course, cannot cover this cost. So testing is performed in Aristotle uh, for free in a single visit. And also the program staff uh, seeks actively this information about social security numbers because people sometimes in the first appointment they already remember their social security number, which I find a bit strange because if you ask me, I don't remember my number. But uh, we remind them to bring it in their second visit. We send them SMS, uh, text reminders. And sometimes we even uh, come, go with them to some uh, public services to seek this social security number. Uh, the other thing is that we, before starting the program, we uh, set up this network of clinicians uh, because I think it was a, an important step if we want really to increase linkage to care. And also, at some point, we hired this peer navigator um, because we realized it was very difficult to have this first appointment with the clinician without some help from us. So some information about the characteristics of our participants. During a period of five months, uh, we recruited 1,088 participants. These are some characteristics, uh, their, their profile. So they are, uh, the majority, of course, they are male. There is 14% who are non-Greeks. So usually they are people from Iran, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan. 
Uh, a large proportion is reports being currently homeless, 29%, and this is a quite worrying um, observation because even from the HIV outbreak that we had, we uh, have found that homelessness was a risk factor for being HIV infected, and it seems that the levels of homelessness remain uh, steady over time in Athens. Uh, although we uh, attract people who report injecting drug use in the past 12 months, actually our population is current injectors, 80% report injecting in the last 30 days. And also despite the fact that drug users in Athens are, uh, heroin is a main substance of use, only 22% report being on OST. So we attract a population that is very high risk and it's not linked to other services. So the prevalence of hepatitis B was 2.6 in the population. Of HIV, it was 16.6, so it was nearly steady after the outbreak. And uh, HIV prevalence was 78%. So out of these, uh, our participants are 1,088 participants. 412 had chronic hepatitis C and were eligible for DAAs. These are the data until September before uh, treatment restrictions uh, were removed. Uh, so the, a large number was eligible because of HIV, HIV co-infection, and the others were eligible because their fiber scan was uh, above seven. So of those who were eligible, 60% uh, uh, were eligible because of their fibrosis states, and the remaining 40% because of their co-infection. And of course, there was a very high number of HIV-infected uh, injecting drug users who were not eligible for treatment until September, but of course, from now on, they can get DAAs. Uh, it's important to see also the, the information concerning genotype. There is a, a difference in the distribution of HIV genotypes depending on, on whether uh, people are co-infected with HIV or not. So among those with HIV-HIV co-infection, genotype 1 is quite prevalent and also genotype 4, whereas among those who have uh, HIV mono-infection, genotype 3 is the most prevalent genotype. <laughs> We tried to assess the cascade of care at first participation to the program. So uh, we have this questionnaire where we ask people if they are aware of being infected with HIV or whether they have received DAAs. So we evaluated this data for these people who tested anti-HIV positive. So we have seen that 68% of our anti-HIV positive uh, uh, participants uh, were aware of being diagnosed, and this is a quite high proportion. In the general population, the proportion of HIV-infected patients who are aware of their uh, infection is only 25%, so drug users seem to be tested very often and they know what happens. But on the other hand, only a very low, low number reports having received treatment with DAA. So I remind you that they are, they are current injectors and they are not linked to OST. So uh, I'm showing you some preliminary results concerning the, the steps that we take towards linkage to care. These results uh, refer only to people with uh, HIV mono-infection without co-infection because co-infected individuals are uh, linked to infectious disease specialists and they have to modify their antiretroviral treatment if they are on ART uh, in order to get DAA. So among those with mono-infection, of, the, of those who have chronic hepatitis C, available social security number after all this effort that we are doing uh, is only for 70%. And of course, all of those are there entered to the National Treatment Registry and can get approval for DAAs. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of data for uh, the rest of the cascade because this needs more uh, collaboration with our clinicians on whether they have actually started and whether they are on treatment. So overall, um, the program combines some features that fac facilitate screening and linkage. First of all, this chain referral sampling is ideal to reach and screen for hepatitis C, a hard to reach population. And all testing is provided in a single visit to the study site, and this is important because otherwise we would uh, lose people. Um, collaborating clinicians uh, have accepted the fact that we want to, to have this new uh, scheme where they, they uh, visit the study site to review patient data and the, enter them to the treatment registry. So uh, patients visit them in their liver clinics when everything is set up, when they have their prescription, everything is ready. And I think they appreciate this new uh, scheme. And also it's very important, the fact that we have this peer navigator because otherwise we see that we would, um, in some cases it would be difficult for people to make this first uh, contact with a doctor. 
so through this uh, approach, we have uh, reached a large number of active drug users not linked to OST. Two out of three HIV-infected drug users were aware of their infection, but a very low proportion reported treatment with DAAs. And in the presence of treatment restrictions, four out of 10 participants were eligible to receive DAAs. And now that these restrictions are removed, we estimate that seven out of 10 participants will be uh, eligible to receive DAAs. Uh, challenges, there are many challenges uh, that we are currently facing from the start of the program. Now we have uh, ongoing efforts to identify and issue social security number for participants because this is very important in order to proceed with the next steps. And we are considering ways of increasing linkage to OST and have peers to support them throughout the treatment because we see that some, some of them already ask uh, our help for that. The program is ongoing. We plan to initiate a second round uh, in January. This means that we are going to start uh, from the beginning and then we will, are going to invite new people but also some of the past participants to participate because we feel that a second or a third visit to the study site will allow to link more and more people to care. And currently also we obtained a, a, a grant to initiate a similar program in the second largest city in, uh, in Greece, Thessaloniki, where uh, no interventions are being carried out and actually the coverage of needle and syringe programs is really low, one syringe per drug user per year. So I would like to acknowledge my collaborators on this and thank you.